back again and now we're talking about how to read this for the period that leads into Constantine and I know a lot about that history so I can speak more authoritatively about what each of these words means the more you know about a section of history that's t tagged in the meter the more you understand what the meter is saying because if you were alive during that time you would know a lot our problem is that we know so little about history today that these, you know, these tags don't make a lot of sense to us when we have to, you know, go look up the history. But I spent a lot of time on Constantine's history because I first found how this meter worked in the New Testament in Ephesians 1 about eight years ago. So that's why I can talk about this now. And this way you'll see the methodology. Again, I'm not trying to convince you that what I'm saying is true. I'm trying to show you the methodology so you can prove to yourself what is true. Because the methodology will be the same whether I'm getting the right answers or not. Okay, and then along the way maybe you'll found, find new methods to use. Okay, so we're going to start there. And here's Matthew up here in the top window again. And the ending marker is 250. What you're doing is you're first taking the text and you're breaking it by clause. I've covered this before, but this is a little refresher. You take the Bible text by clause and you break it down by clause because for a lot of reasons that have to do with the way um, Greek is structured, that's how they did their writing. Okay, so a clause will cover a period of history that is itself, in itself, alone a process of that time period. It's a time period because it's metered. Now the same is true in the Old Testament but the style is a little bit different. Okay, In the New Testament they go by clause. They might use clausal breakdowns in the Old Testament too. Um, Anoni Nominon in Frank Forum is working on that but uh, right now I don't see any particular relevance per clause in the Hebrew. But in the Greek it sticks out. Okay, so here we got, and we'll rise up in order, in order to do battle. Okay, and we'll rise up, therefore, gar means therefore, it's post positive. Nation, upon literally, but it means against, nation. That's the text. And we'll rise up, therefore, nation against nation. Eper, I'm going to, my, my, it's early in the morning and I'm not good at pronouncing Greek. Egertesetai. It's I, not A. Okay, modern Greek pronunciation is A. E, that's a syllable. Ger, that's the second syllable. De, that's the third syllable. It's, it's, it's like saying T, but you're just very light against the back of your, te your teeth when you say the T sound. Okay. E, Ger, te, se, tai. E ger te se tai. Okay. Gar, et, nos, e, pi, et, nos. Okay. E ger te se tai gar, et nos, e pi, et nos. Okay. That's the best I can do at this hour of the morning. It's like, what, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. 250 is the ending. That means 280 A.D. In 280 A.D., what was happening? It was musical chairs. The historians today call that period of time the crisis of the 3rd century. You can Google on the term. It is a historical name for the time period. Okay? What it meant was Rome was basically breaking apart, and it wasn't just breaking apart in the West, it was breaking apart in the East. Most of the money that Rome lived on came from the East. It was Rome made most of its money by taxation and trade, okay? And by selling this idea of Rome as a glorious entity that everybody bought into, so that you wanted, it was like, you know, cool to be in Rome. It was cool to be a Roman. When they take you over, they would sell you on their culture. 
and they wouldn't take away your own culture. So you were part of a bigger culture. All right? It's just, it's it's America pretty runs um, pretty much runs on the same idea that you know, you come to this country, you have your own culture. Nobody's trying to take it away. But there's a bigger culture you can also be part of. So that's why we use the phrase like African American or Italian American or German American. You might have come from Germany or Africa or wherever. But you're an American now too. Okay? That was the basic idea in Rome. You came from Judea or you came from Serenica or you came from, you know, uh, Galatia. But you were also, maybe, if you got your citizenship after 20 years of military service, you were a Roman. And that mattered. It was a big deal in those days. Okay, well, this Rome was breaking up. You had musical chair emperors. You had one guy in Britain, another guy in Spain, another guy in what we call France, which they called Gaul, another guy in Germany, which they had by different names. Another guy in Judea, another guy in, in Egypt, another guy, you know, farther, farther east. And they all claimed they were emperors and they each had an army. The army declared them emperor over all Rome. And so what would happen is all these so-called emperors would fight with each other for the last man standing. It was kind of like a reality TV show of Survivor. Who's going to be the last one standing? Well, the last guy standing was going to come three years after this, and his name was going to be Diocletian. Okay, but right here, it hadn't happened yet. Right here, you got a guy um, named Carus, and his he had a son named um, Numerian, and I've, like, the other one was named Carinus. They were kids. And it was Carus who was almost the last man standing at that point. But it was musical chair emperors all over what we would call Europe and the Middle East, including the northern part of Africa. So it was one great big set of wars. Everybody was running around. Everybody was, you know, um, hassling everybody else. Every, it was like, you, it depended on what side you were. If, if, if the Roman emperor, suppose the Roman emperor near you was one guy and you had been supporting the other guy, you could lose your life, your property, your everything. It was a very dangerous time to be alive. Everything was disrupted. I mean, just think about what would happen if there was civil war in the United States. And I don't mean civil war like the kind we had where they all united north and south. I mean civil war where every state decided it was going to exit. Okay? That's the kind of warring that's going on here when it says nation against nation. And the meaning of nation in Greek is a people. In other words, you all come from the same set of parents or the same family and you're all cousins of cousins of cousins of cousins of cousins cousins so you can think of it like tribe tribe against tribe that's the meaning of nation in the Bible because that's how nations originally developed they were familial alright so you can be a tribe, though, without blood relation. You can be a tribe by saying, Well, I belong to Karas. And another guy says, Well, I belong to whoever else the other musical emperors were at that time. There were a bunch of them. Okay? And if you go to places like down here, it's not showing the, the marker anymore. But I have links to these individuals. Okay? And one of the links is to romanemperors.org, D-I-R. You can just type in D-I-R Roman Emperor and you'll find it. Um, they have the whole list of the emperors, but they don't necessarily have articles per emperor. So where they don't, you can go to Wikipedia or, you know, just search on the name in Google. There are a lot of articles on these people. There's a lot of good scholarship on this time period. And I have, like, a thousand books on it so you can go to Amazon and buy them too okay so and will arise at Gertesite at Gertesite rather I've been too influenced by modern Greek at Gertesite Gar Ethnos Epi Ethnos okay that was the time so see how this meter really is helpful it's not only talking about the end times, you know, at the, 
you know, the tribulation. It's talking about a trend of history also, in any time. But this is very specific, so you know what this text means. And will rise against each other, nation against nation. See, it's very specific. So when you see and will rise nation against nation, it's talking about a specific period of time. So you know what the text means. It's not talking about just any nation against any nation. Like, you know, on any given day, the Soviet Union was against China, was against the West, was against the U.S. Okay? And to some extent, all those tensions remain. Well, that's nation against nation, too, but it's a specific kind. It's a warring kind. It's armies backing different claimants to the Roman throne. Okay? So it's a lot more severe and specific. So when you're looking at the end times for the tribulation, it will be specific like that. You see? So you know how to interpret these words will rise nation against nation. In English, that sounds generic and syrupy. And it's like, what do you mean rise nation against nation? The U.S. is against Russia. The Russia is against the U.S., blah, blah, blah. But we're not fighting. A cyber war, I guess you could say. But there's no, there's no army. Okay, well, here it is army. So it's not talking about just any kind of opposition of one kind of nation to another kind of nation. It's talking about chaos. All right? So see how this meter helps you interpret the text? That's the most important thing I want you to get out of this thing. How the meter helps you interpret the text. That's its purpose. Yes, it's talking about a real historical period. But now it becomes like... Oh, it's just like what happened back in the third century. Yes. That's what's going to happen again. Same model. You know, maybe in the future it'll be planes and tanks rather than a bunch of horsemen and foot soldiers and, you know, people living off the land. But it will still be, you know, fragmented like that. This was a totally fragmented Europe, a totally fragmented Middle East, a totally fragmented Northern Africa. And then, of course, Israel's being caught in the middle of it. That's how it's going to be again. Updates with the names and the places and the people and the weapons, but still fragmented. You see the point? Okay, so that's covering from, that's covering 12 years ending... 280. Alright? So now, alright, so that's one layer of meaning to this time period. This 12 year period ending in 280. What, well, okay, now what, how are we going to find it in the next book? This is Luke. Luke wraps around Matthew always. Okay, and notice now he is going straight to Diocletian. This is exactly what Paul does in his meter. In Ephesians 1.10, Paul meters it to 283. So, 283. Now, here's what's really important about that and what's so wry about it and how you know it has to be God. Diocletian dated his own rule to 283. That's not his official rule. Okay? This is really important. Diocletian dated his own rule to 283. Specifically, November. Why? Because he got a sign from a gypsy that if he killed a boar, the name is Affer, which would be the name of the guy that was guarding Carus's sons, then he would become rich and famous. Well, that's what he did in 283. He killed a guy whose surname was Affer. Okay, it's a long story, but it basically was that Carus had two kids. Diocletian was in the army part of the army guarding, you know, with those two kids. One of the kids, I think it was Numerus, Numerian, um, died. And Aphra was supposed to be guiding Numerian. Aphra was like his adjutant. And Numerian had died, but Aphra didn't tell anybody he died, and they kept on carrying the litter in which Numerian was sitting, now dead, for a couple of days. And then they found out that Numerian was dead. So Diocletian 
keying off hit this old prophecy he got from a gypsy when he was like 17. He says, oh, your name is Afra. If I kill you, then I will be, I will be rich and famous like the gypsy said. So he killed him with his hands. That's going to become important because the hands are addressed in Revelation. Diocletian's hands killed Afra in front of the troops. Okay? So he's thinking, okay, well, I kill this guy, then I'm going to become rich and famous. Because that's what the gypsy told me to do. So that's what he did, and he becomes emperor as a result of it. That's why he dates his own rule to 283, but official Roman rule for him didn't begin till two years later. Now you see, God picks out these little things, and then he preserves the history so that we can know about these little things, because I read about this in a book called The Persecution of Diocletian. It was written in 1876. And where that guy got his sources, I don't know. But I linked to it in my Ephesians 1 piece because this is what put the whole meter together for me. This guy, Diocletian. 283 is when he personally dated his own rule. It's kind of like Augustus. He dated his own rule to the Battle of Actium. But Rome didn't make him um, first citizen because they didn't call it, use the word Caesar in those days. Rome didn't make him first citizen until um, a couple of years later. All right? In other words, this is the personal, personal identity by the emperor of his own rule. Same for Augustus. Okay? So 283, which both Ephesians 1, 10, and Luke 21, here it's verse 11, last clause. See? Luke 21, 11. Both of them tag Diocletian's own personal dating of his rule three years after this. Okay, so now, with, armed with that little bit of tidbit of information, which is going to be played on in the latter two books also, what extra text about this same period do we have? Okay, well, the three syllables, the extra three syllables are este, estai, merala. Okay, so you just have to leave it. It's la, estai. It's cut out because that's the rise of Diocletian. And at the I, which is really hysterical, at the I, that's where he kills um, Afro and becomes emperor. I is like the sound of I is a definite article in the Greek. Okay, so it's kind of like saying, hi, you think you're emperor of the world, but you're really only a definite article. Okay, so up until me. So from here to here. We're covering the same period of history as here in Matthew 24. Okay, so it's here and here. Okay, so what does this text say in Greek? Esontai probeta probetra te kai ap uranu semaya me. My badly pronounced Greek. Esontai probetra te kai ap uranu semaya me. Okay, so what is it? There will be what do you want to call it, wonders, that's how it's usually translated, and in the heaven signs. And you usually in your English translation you'll have is, there'll be signs and wonders in the heavens. Okay, now do you see how funny that is? Sign, that's the word sign. Okay, our boy is executing Afer, which means boar, because he got a sign from a gypsy when he was a Teenager. Yeah, yeah, here's a sign. To him, it's a sign. Okay? Great signs and wonders in the heaven. Now, our normal translation, or our normal meaning of this, the normal word meaning of these things, is that there's going to be all kinds of stuff that show weird stuff in the sky. Okay? 
like we're having right now. I mean, a lot of people are, are the, you, you know, we humans are so bad, we don't, until bad stuff happens, we don't even think about God. Like right now, we had all these hurricanes, all these fires, we've got earthquakes going on, we have volcanoes acting up, we even have plagues going on in Madagascar. All happening within the same few months. So a lot of people are starting to ask, oh, is this God's judgment? See the point? And yeah, it is. And everybody and his brother is now kind of trying to figure out how to explain all this. And, you know, they're trying to pass it off as climate change, which is a big lie. There's no amount of things that you can do that can make an earthquake happen. There's no amount of things you can do that can make a volcano spew out and whatever a volcano spews out it's like a hundred years worth of any pollution that mankind can do all right you know th there's no science on climate change it's just all fake all right and and if you ever even sp spent like an, a year in real science you would know that okay well but people say oh sign maybe this is a sign from God you know everybody's thinking that the end of the world is coming you know, whenever you have this stuff, well, that tells you the attitude of what's happening. And I'm sure there were, I mean, I didn't go look it up, but I'm sure there were earthquakes and all kinds of weird comets or whatever coming from the heavens. That doesn't mean that God did it that way. Okay? I mean, nothing happens without his permission, but on the other hand, he gives everything an independent life. So the sun has an independent life. The comets have an independent life. All right, the water has an independent life, so sometimes it acts up, but God could stop it at any time. All right, so did God literally order these signs and wonders to be in the heaven, or is it just their function as part of their independent life? I have an independent life. You have an independent life. God gave it to you. God gives it to the animals. He gives it to the insects. He gives it to the air. He creates it and it gives it an independent life of its own and it's going to have a certain behavior as it's independent. So was the behavior independently operating such that it looked like signs and wonders to the people seeing it? Or did God actually order it to do what it did? I don't know. I'd have to go look up what happened during that time. But that's one of the key elements for this time that's being added to nation against nation. Now the other thing that's important to say, and this is very true of Greek drama, so you have to bear it in mind. When it's talking about signs and wonders, that's not necessarily um, weather. That's not necessarily physical air. Signs and wonders could be the way that these troops are fighting against each other. See, it, it, it's Greek drama to say that the heavens get all upset when something that is going on with man is warlike. When man is going to war with man, it's a common Greek technique to say that the heavens are upset because the basic Greek myth about God versus man is that everything that happens on earth is playing a drama in heaven. So that the, the signs and wonders aren't necessarily signs and wonders in the sky. Okay but they depict them that way because that's just a Greek drama metaphor for saying the gods. Okay? So, it could be that man's activity, all right, is like a sign in wonder. Because some guy wins and he shouldn't have. Because some guy loses and he shouldn't have. Because some weird miracle-like thing or disaster-like thing happens that you can't explain. Unexplainable things that have to do with the warring. Okay? And yeah, that stuff did happen by both definitions, any way you want to look, physical and non-physical, during this time. I mean, just go look up the period and you'll see it yourself. Okay? So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that, but it is an advance on Nation rises against nation, which causes upheaval in the heavens. That's the basic metaphor in Greek drama. 
Man rising against man causes upheaval in the heavens, or upheaval in the heavens causes man to rise against man. That's the idea being broached here. That's the additional text meaning. Okay? In Ephesians 1.10 for this period, it's got the longest name that there is, Anakepaleostate, to bring under one head. Everything under the heavens, everything under the earth. So you see, Luke is playing on Ephesians when he writes this about signs in the heavens because that's what the Ephesians 1 text is about. Okay, bringing under one head everything in the heavens and everything on earth. That's what the Ephesians 1.10 ending is about. Okay, so Luke is playing to Ephesians when he writes this. Or Ephesians is playing to Luke. I still can't quite decide. But you'll see that that text is related. Alright. And now that you know what the Greek idea is, it's due to the warring. Okay? Or the warring is due to the warring in heaven. Okay? As a metaphor of explanation. The point is that it's really bad. You got that. And of course the word sign is, is really hysterical because that's why Diocletian killed the guardian of Numerian. Because his last name was Afer, and if he killed a boar, he would become rich and famous. Yes, he becomes emperor as a result. So you see how witty this is? See how specific it is? So when you're looking at the future, and it's like, well, there's supposed to be signs and wonders in the heaven in our future, you know, time of tribulation and up until the time of tribulation. Yeah, it's a trend of history. But what kind of trend of history? What kind? How severe? Well, it'll be like the period of the crisis of the third century, repeating itself. Every time the text, this is not the only time the text was worded like this about signs and wonders. It's going to be repeated. Okay, so then the, the text that applied to the crisis of the third century giving rise to Diocletian will happen again. And the text will say when it happens again. Generically, you understand that it's going to happen periodically, so you don't get all nervous and say it's the end. That's the point. Because that's what people are doing now. They see all these earthquakes, they see these fires, they see the, the, uh, the hurricanes that are really bizarre. They're happening all over the world now. They're not just happening to the southeastern United States. And they're saying, oh, this must be the time of the end. And this text is basically telling you, no, it's part of the last times. It's part of the last days. But it's not a sign of the end. There are big signs that were in the last days. But the last days have been going on for 2,000 years now. Hello? It's not yet the end. Okay? And we're going to come to that because that's where we are in Mark, see, it's not yet the end. Upo, not yet. Upo, totelos. Not yet the end. And that's what we'll pick up in the next increment.